Hey, everybody, welcome to another Rollback. Today is one of my all-time favorite episodes. It's from July of 2014, and it highlights the life of a man who broke free from a life of quiet desperation. Born John Kitchen, Slomo is a spry and vigorous 79-year-old dude who is this former successful neurologist turned happiness guru who, and this is no joke, rollerblades in slow motion along the San Diego coast, which is basically most of what he does. Unable to continue his former life, Slomo quit his job. He sold all of his possessions and made a simple self-promise to slow down and start smelling the roses with one singular fundamental premise. Do what you love. For John, this edict translated to one very specific activity, rollerblading all day, every day. This conversation is wild. It's about life transformation. It's about finding joy and contentment. It's about living in the moment, meditation, community, and so much more. And though this was recorded eight years ago now, I can assure you that Slomo is still out there getting after it every single day. So it is my honor and it's my pleasure to bring you the story of Slomo. They call me slow mo. Slow mo. Yeah. All right. Why not? Right. Exactly. Right. Why not? Well, uh, there's a difference. Tell there. me the difference. The nickname is much more meaningful mm -hmm. because it applies to the person. You earned it. Yeah. It. But, but it, you, you could say you earned it, but it's from a different part of your family. It's from the world of strangers. Mm -hmm. It's given to you by people who were not, in all likelihood, not family members. And they're relating to you. They begin to relate to you first as an unknown. And then they identified you as an abstract, which is more in the category of a person. So um, to me, uh, it's a stage of development in a person. It's to separate him from his... Uh, the objective, uh, credentialed, sort of legal mm -hmm. side. You know? Yeah, the, the moniker that is placed upon you uh, yeah. without your involvement at birth versus yeah. Yeah. sort of the true kind of actualized self that yeah. the world recognizes yeah. you as being. And it's parallel <clears throat> to the um, dichotomy of experiencing yourself during the first phase of your life as an object even though you, you're subjective, you experience mm -hmm. yourself as an object in the world. But as you evolve in the latter half of life, you begin to experience yourself as a subjective entity mm -hmm. in a world which is objective and separated. And um, these sports which are in a special category, nine-team sports, sports which are um, individual, activities which are individual, evolve during that lifetime so that as a person ages, what appears to be an activity in the objective world becomes a type of activity in a subjective world, which this person spends his time more and more in a state of mind which is similar to worship mm -hmm. as opposed to the state of mind that he would have had in the earlier phase of his life when participating in action, he would be an aggress in an aggressive uh, state of mind fixed on the external world. Mm -hmm. it, it goes to this, I mean, you're, you know, a lot of what your life is about is dichotomies and, and more specifically the dichotomy of the zone versus the non-zone. I read your manifesto, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. And, I'm, and, and sort of the use of the, this word zone as being expansive, you know, really encompassing what, you know, maybe in more mainstream circles would be just known as God or, or the universe yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. word you want to place upon it, higher power, uh, and the idea of the subjectivity that goes hand in hand with 
being in the zone or being merged with the zone versus the objectivity of the non-zone state of sort of being, you know, in the world. That's right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so in, in 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 the most simplistic terms, if you could sort of expand on that idea, explain explain really where, what you're getting at with that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, in all the activities of life, this particular dualism exists, mm-hmm. where a person uh, it, it can observe something in the zone and ha- or experience the the zone. And it's quite different than the non-zone, all right? Um, if you look at all those activities, they all have a set of um, intelligent and wise people who discover the zone within that activity. Mm-hmm. Now, the one I like, I like to see the people that experience the zone is in the spectacular sports that we get to observe on television, well, that's where it's most readily kind of apparent yeah, 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 to, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, the, to the eye, right? Yeah. Um, it, it first occurred to me that what was happening when I watched that movie by, uh, with uh, uh, Chariots of Fire. Uh, one of my favorites. Yeah. You remember when the, uh, the runner fell during, mm-hmm. I think it was an 880 uh, run, and his friends were in the audience. He fell, and then he got up and began to try to catch up with the other runners, and Van Gallis, who was doing the music, mm-hmm. switches him into slow motion. <laughs> he's going in slow motion, though he's gaining on these other runners. And the cameraman switches it to the crowd, and his friends are standing up, and what the girl, one of the women, says, do you see it? Or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And what they were seeing really interests me because I think that's what we saw when we watched Michael Jordan perform in the Mm -hmm. zone. We were seeing something in the way that Amazing Grace uses the word vision. We were experiencing something attached to vision which uh, was in another world. That is, the, the person who was, it's, we were watching someone in a pure state of worship. Mm-hmm. And that's impressive. And mm-hmm. matter of fact, that's one reason I think some of the people line the streets of Rome when the Pope goes up and down. I think he's supposed to be, and I say supposed to be, a it, relatively close, at least a representation of a state of worship. Right. But the athlete, when he's hitting three-pointers, say in basketball, say four or five three-pointers in a row, he is almost by definition in the, what he calls the zone. Right, and the subjectivity aspect of it is that time is not a linear construct. Time is more an elastic idea, and, and it's an expansive place for the present where past and future are no longer. Whereas in the non-zone, the sort of logical thinking brain and the way we kind of carry ourselves through the world, we're basically spending all of our time thinking about the past or projecting right. the future, right? Exactly. So, right. so, so it's really, it's kind of come into vogue lately. Like it's, it's sort of been captured now. Now it's called the flow state or you know, right? there's okay. a book the, yeah, out yeah, about okay. it and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. and a lot of scientists yeah. studying it from a non-zone perspective, I would imagine. But yeah. the idea being like, how can we access more of this zone-like state in our own daily lives, That's the, but it's, uh, it, it's a spiritual practice. It's not something that can be accessed through the thinking mind. You know, I think that uh, any of us, and, and correct me because I haven't really tested the idea, but um, we could say, what is the purpose of our life? The first thing, the first purpose is to achieve some method to experience the zone. And then try to do everything you can from within the zone because the zone is a superior state of mind and it will produce the best athletics the best behavior for instance the problems that we're having in our country is that we're we're we've almost divorced the zone entirely from uh international and national politics that uh there's no Zone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're living in a country that's passed into the non-zone. Right. And uh, in a way, 
the people, the great athletes of which I would include you and the other people that are in their own way experiencing tremendous feats of athletic prowess, they are obviously uh, a new, to me, the manifestation of a new type of worship that's taking place as they've been pushed a little bit to the edge of the society. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're not dominating, the zone's not dominating people in the zone. We watch it in athletics and all, but uh, it's not the idea of people. So it's left a lot of people zoneless, so mm -hmm. to speak. They're, I mean, if, if you think about it, there's absent Mandela, there's not a single exemplary person in the world that we all would agree and can, you know, in our individual lives, sure. But to think that the world has been in our lifetime bereft of really a, a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. From a leadership perspective. Yes. I mean, I think that, yes. yeah, on the fringes. Well, there's the athletes, of course, but I would expand, you know, the zone idea to anybody who has who has uh, created any a, a great creative expression like the art any, any great artist yes. will tell you that yes. their painting or their yes. sculpture doesn't yes. come from the intellectual part of their mind right. they're channeling right. it from something else and that right. thinking mind goes away and they're definitely in a zone like state to right. produce whatever it is that they're trying to master right I reckon the yeah I agree totally with what you said I, I reckon the point I'm trying to to make is that the practice of life, the practice of living, is performed in some way which is either falling into the non-zone or the zone. And if you take a society, you can look at the society itself and see where the dominant part of the society resides on that spectrum mm -hmm. and you if, if there is something that you could apply this knowledge to not only to your personal uh, life but um to the way we analyze um any part of this life for instance if you went to a country you could say, well, how well, it, how good is their music, and how well it, uh, you could use any criteria. But what about how close are they as a society, so that everybody can experience his own uh, advancement into the zone? Mm -hmm. How zony is a society? <laughs> In other words, I think if you use um, uh, some of these, if you think of societies. There are societies that uh, you can point to that had no zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had very little zone. They, mm -hmm. In other words, almost by definition, a Nazi society mm -hmm. decides to or perform totally in the world of objectivity. Mm -hmm. And um, the, probably the opposite, whatever the opposite is, you would think uh, would say that the society, I would say like uh, an ancient uh, Japanese society or something mm -hmm. like that. The idea was peace and harmony that uh, so people could advance themselves spiritually. That was the goal. You could tell that the thing was set up to advance that goal. Mm -hmm. And and probably considering the depth of poverty and all the rest of it during the Dark Ages, it was also uh, the society was set up to give the main structure to the individual who could pursue a spiritual existence, that is, a, mm -hmm. a zony existence, okay? I mean, with they didn't have the wherewithal to experience it that we do now, but you could see with what they had, religion and spirituality and the state of worship was held as the highest um, form of Right, endeavor. it was a, a cultural prerogative. It I mean, was I a think cultural in, prerogative. Yeah, in, the, in modern times, I mean, you know, what are we left with? I suppose, in some respects, the, you know, the Tibetan monks or yeah. uh, certain, you, you know, removed cultures that have been remained untouched by the gestalt of, you know, us sort of right. exporting our Western way of life across the globe. But it's only small pockets now. And, and well, I guess in certain respects in Indian culture, it's still spiritual advancement is still regarded as 
as a high form of, yeah, of living, you. whereas it's really not here. I mean, we talk about religion, but that's a different beast altogether. All right, now, think in terms of that we are doing it, but we're doing it in our way, and our way is the athletics of the single person, the person who's experiencing the zone. Now, the, you, you can extend that into art, dance, or whatever, or mm-hmm. maybe uh, just getting in, in the state of mind by any method. But if you take that whole group that is um, dedicated to experiencing the state of mind of the zone and put them together, you could say that that same group is the group that put that same thing um, as a priority in other societies and in other times. It's one group, and it's going through it changed uh, through time. The last few thousand years, it cha- It started somewhere in um, Greece or, or Troy, mm-hmm. or out in that area, maybe in India, and it's moved across. It went through Rome, and it went through. Uh, it went up into Europe. And it came across, okay. This uh, the state of the, the, the it's a um, this is a um, some sort of um, phenomenon which has been it's a state of mind. You, the shrinks would call it a state of mind mm-hmm. um, that's been carried by human beings through this corridor over thousands of several thousand years, and. Um, it just changes form. Uh, sometimes it's inside of cathedrals and churches, worshiping that way. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it will. In a lot of the dark ages, it was manifested in building beautiful buildings. The artists now are doing it. The ones that are, are contributing to the um, that are making that are actually pr- where the zone produces the art. Um, and that that might be an interesting topic. To, there's a lot that's, that's, you don't, I mean, I could paint a picture and not be in the zone. Right. Okay. In right, other right. words, I might want to make money, which is, but anyway, that's a whole nother subject. We don't. Right. But the, the, this idea of tapping into a oneness and a greater, and a power that's greater than, than yourself. That's and c- as an athlete, you know, I've certainly experienced that. And there's, there's no way that, you know, I know for a fact that, the things that I've been able to do as an athlete don't come from my power. Into it. it's it's only by tapping into something larger than myself. You know, I'm I'm very very in touch with that, um, <clears throat> and I think that's a. If you start to talk about that, then you start to get maligned as some sort of insane, no no no. But person. you shouldn't you shouldn't <laughs> yeah. because uh, that's what I mean. Right now, the pressure of the social conventions is totally in favor of the non-zone. You, in other words, you, uh, when George Bush <laughs> said that he had learned more from, they asked him what single man that he learned the most from, he said, Jesus Christ. Half the people responded with a nod that that's absolutely the correct answer for anybody that really has spent time reading the New Testament and then and, and thought in terms of other people looked at his head, that would have to stand out. But the other half thought that it was a, a cheated answer because it was using religion, okay? Mm-hmm. Or, and, and so any time a person, um, even if he starts talking about Buddha nowadays, you know, it, you can't even talk about Buddha. Right? Buddha is out of style, even in California. Think right. of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this thing, but the same group is pursuing the worship. They don't care about what you call it. They don't care if you call it the Christ, the fundamental man, the force, the spirit, whatever it is. They call it the soul. Generically, it's what people call the soul. And the scientists that dominate the non-zone have declared for a long time now that there is absolutely no existence of the soul, that this is a myth. And that even the uh, the Buddhist and other people, a lot of them would, would say something to that effect. So uh, we're... The again, it's the dichotomy of the non zone and the zone. When you're in the zone, you never this, and you can correct me if this is if you agree with this or disagree, you never question whether there's a higher power or whether there's a God. It doesn't occur to you to question it. 
it doesn't occur to you to question that you exist as a as an entity of some kind of subjective something that could be called a soul. It those questions and doubts only exist when the mind is in the non zone. Mm-hmm. And so why is this so difficult for us as a culture to grasp? I mean, we're so focused on, you know, our cultural, cultural priorities are to, you know, sort of move up the corporate ladder and, and accumulate these material goods and, you know, keep up with the Joneses and all of these sorts of things. These are the ideas and the thoughts and the mindset that we walk around with on a daily basis. Uh, and this sort of greater truth is staring us in the face, and yet it's so difficult to access for most people. I think it's like playing golf. Everybody's playing the same course, and everybody has to get over the, get through the same set of traps, <laughs> you know? And frankly, if you look at the big traps, the big traps are, are fame, that's one of them, and money or power, and, um, and, and all the subdivisions of those and all that. But those are the... I, if you use an old way of thinking that we evolved ontologically, each of us, we go through an evolution involvement. Like we start out close to, say, a chimpanzee behavior or something like that, and we gradually advance through the king, the, the king, and you get to the top, and the top is some sort, has some sort of benign, wise personality, okay, that's nonviolent. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, and that way of looking at it um, hell I'm, I lost track of this yeah. idea <laughs> <laughs> alright well, we can get back to it but I want to get it, I want to get into your story a little bit because you were uh, you weren't always the philosopher king that you are now <laughs> right so let's let's take it back I mean I want to hear uh, you know I want to get into the evolution of what what uh, you know, forged this identity known as slow mo. So, you know, back in the South, growing up on the dairy farm and oh, yeah, going to yeah, you know yeah. going to medical school, and you know what your life was like as a practicing. Uh, you were a neurologist, right? Uh, so, yeah, I want to hear uh, about that. Well, it has. I started out on a little farm, but it was looking back on it, it was the ideal place for a child to grow up. On. Um, as a matter of fact, it was so ideal where I was born and the family into which I was born and my childhood was so ideal from my perspective now of what's meaningful is that I almost thought that maybe this is a circumstantial proof for the existence of some prior existence where I chose to be born. In the, in the, in the sense that it's perfectly unfolded. Yeah, like I, it was just uh, the farm had a nice woods where you could run. Um, th- my parents were were um, very benevolent people with no meanness or hatred. Um, my older brother and younger brother were um, just as athletic as me. Uh, my sister was healthy and nice looking i mean the whole thing and the and the uh, and the fact that we didn't have money mm-hmm. uh, we like uh, uh, pretty much had uh, two at uh, the most three cars um most of the time it was one car um that is it during the whole period <laughs> right right <laughs> i got gotcha. you <laughs> the first one lasted i mean it uh-huh. was not like it was we i, I think looking back on it the fact that we were poor, like um, uh, like really, you had to have a, a hole in your shoe to get another pair of shoes. I remember that it was it really was fun being that way. But on the other hand, my father and his uh, wife, my mother, had come from intellectual families, so we had all the uh, books around and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, they from spoke what I understand, well. so it's sort of a prominent family. They it, come it's from a, in Wake Forest area, right? Right, and that area. It was like we were the poorest of the kitchens, but the kitchens, uh, then nobody was wealthy. There wasn't a, as mm-hmm. far as I know, there were no. That, it wasn't no. spilling downhill your way, <laughs> whatever was going on the rest of the kitchen family. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I don't think anybody was very wealthy in, in those days. 
you know, matter even. But it was a name people knew. Yeah, the pay, kitchens. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had contributed a lot in the way of politics, um, at various places and all that. But so, so was your uh, drive to, you know, succeed as a doctor? Did that derive from not wanting to be poor anymore, or where did that kind of ambition come from? I think that the fact. I think some of my life can be explained for the fact that I thought I experienced myself as being poor as a child. And I wanted to see what it was like to to see, um, you know, where people were. I at least wanted to get close to experiencing what I thought was wealthy. I think that that's what everybody, there's a temptation. That's Mm -hmm. the reason, you know, you can almost see this person driving a car, particular car, if he's able to eventually buy the car that he really wants it's the one he saw when he was uh when younger he was a kid, yeah right. <laughs> in which he had some money to buy uh-huh. a car but anyway um yeah uh, the um no no I, my f- grandfather had been president of Wake Forest and was a stro- oh, wow. extraordinary um prominent kind of person so I always had that to kind of uh, fall back on my father was right. a, if, every, a, if everything blows up yeah, you could yeah. Go, back, <laughs> go back to grandpa <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, my father was a, a gentle kind of uh, just a very kind soft-spoken uh, man with um, the ambition to be a farmer and nothing much mm-hmm. more Southern than that. gentleman. Well, he had <laughs> he proven he could at least get through law school, but he just didn't take a liking to it and mm-hmm. quit. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and in some respects, that his evolution was very, predates your own. <laughs> it's a similar cycle, yeah, right? It is. It's very similar. And of all the children, I look like him and have a lot of the same little characteristics. Uh, for what that's worth, even though I I had the usual conflicts with my father, I wasn't like I was a more I was closer to him than the other two, mm-hmm. three. So so you ship off to Duke. Went to Duke. Duke. Yeah, you the first to... year I was first in my class. Really? Yeah. Wow. And And I I was thinking like, geez, I must be some sort of genius, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then I joined a fraternity, and um, that, I started drinking beer. Mm-hmm. For about three or four years, I'd call it my beer drinking years. Mm-hmm. I think that those are the best years anybody can have, frankly. I know what that's like. Yeah, well, drinking beers with your friends at night and talking whatever it is, politics or sports or whatever, just that kind of fellowship is about as good as it ever gets. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I enjoyed that part, but my my grades dropped to about half. Where I, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> but <laughs> I know what that's like too. Yeah. You know, and looking back on it, my hero was Nietzsche. Okay, I was planning to be some sort of mad intellectual, you know, with books all around me. That was mm-hmm. my goal. Um, but I, I, after being in the fraternity and all like, uh, and and kind of leveling out a little bit. Um, I thought that being a doctor was a reasonable choice. Mm-hmm. And, it, and in a way, it was a choice out of cowardice in my case because I could, I was smart enough to, to do it, but it was a safe way to go through life. Right. Almost like a lot of things that look like the dangerous things, for instance, the military, it really is the safe choice. Mm-hmm. Um but I made the safe choice. I can remember I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And, uh, geez, it's like somebody staying in graduate school. That's well, what I it, did. It's the burden of being intelligent and well-educated. You have you almost That's feel right. like, That's oh, right. well, you know, I That's can't right. go be an actor. I've got to go. That's you know, right. I, I'm right. too, you know, I need to go do the thing that I am capable of doing. That the other thing society is. Society will smile upon me. Uh, Vietnam was raging at the time. Uh, so that was also in the, yeah. people were. Um, they were going and getting killed. I had some fraternity brothers that were mm-hmm. killed the first year that they went. Um, so, stay in I'd, school. I'd, I figured I, I'm not going to, you know, I'd already decided I'm not going to run to Canada. And uh, it's about a 10% chance that I'm going to get shot. So, probably it makes sense just if you get drafted just to go. But I didn't like the way they were prosecuting that war. 
And I really don't like the way we've prosecuted these other wars since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I really, as a child, didn't like the way that we prosecuted the Korean War. I was watching all this my Mm -hmm. whole life. I've been watching this stuff. It is absolutely disgraceful. Mm -hmm. So Uh, stay in school, become a doctor. Yeah, well... It's an easy way to bow out of that equation. You don't have to, to, to do it, but... Um, it's not a bad way of life, particularly now, nowadays, the way our society is. The military is a very good choice of a way to live. Well, I think we could, it, 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 you know, we could do a little bit better with taking care of the troops when they come. Oh, yeah. Out. You know, we're not doing such a good, <laughs> good job of that other than yeah, bumper agree. stickers that say yeah. support your troops. So, you know, yeah. the, the level of PTSD and, and the level of care that these people deserve uh, yeah. far outweighs what they're getting. You know, uh, it's well known by anybody that reads history, and that might not include a lot of our politicians. But the troops, you, sometimes they come back from these wars where the politicians don't do so good, and they wreck the society. Now, the troops came back from Vietnam after they had been, uh, to some extent, stabbed in the back, and they didn't do anything. The same thing happened after they drew a draw there with the first Iraq thing. Now the same thing is happening with these other two recent wars. And you wonder, the reason the VA is being in such bad repair is that these politicians are not under any threat from the returning soldiers like they have been in other societies, and I'm thinking Germany. (coughs) that the politicians here get away with this kind of stuff. The troops come back and they just tolerate it. Hmm. Well, it's, yeah, it's a tricky situation. I mean, the, the VA is such a massive bureaucratic organization. that but you would think that implement. the troops having the weapons would have some power. Why do they let themselves be taken advantage of like that by people who have Maybe they have paper power, but they don't have any guns. Hmm. Well, I think that the transparency of the Internet is starting to change that. I mean, you're starting to see articles and people speaking out, and I think there's a greater awareness of that situation than maybe there was, you know, even a couple years ago. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I hope that. Good. I I probably went off on a little (laughs) political thing. That's all right, but uh, I want to get to the doctor part. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. That's all right. Hey, Matt, I got all day. I just don't want to keep you too long from no, your no, uh, skating. No, no, it's a good interview. Actually, I like, it. I like your interview. I, 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 it's, um, you, I like the questions. Um, yeah, and I went to, I, I was um, at Wake Forest Medical mm-hmm. School. Bowman Gray is the name of it. And um, they were the, again, it was a fabulous time. It was a great bunch of people, fantastic people, student, fellow students, and mm-hmm. fantastic just general and a lot of heroic types. I, I had uh, several mentors that were just and still are the top as far as human beings, mm-hmm. uh, the quality of the human being. And, and just be, matter of fact, when you came, you showed up right on time. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I always watch that with a new person to yeah. see how close <laughs> to the time it is. Okay. <laughs> And I can tell you a lot about it because we used to watch uh, one of the, the head of neuro, the neurologic department, mm-hmm. uh, a guy named James Toole. And literally, he would walk from his house, which was two miles away, and get on the elevator and do all that and get through the hospital and to the chamber where he was going to uh, lecture and would walk in right as the, the hand came to the exact time. Mm-hmm. And we used to notice he always did that, you know. So and then and then you'll know uh, you can notice who who's before and after and how long and like that. And you see that there's a span. But the the some of the other people I remember um, uh, there's the dean eventually the dean Jane uh, uh, Janeway dean, um, Dick Janeway had been uh, in the movies as a child. And he was just a spectacular person to watch and um, to listen to. And so I just, I mean, that... The dean of the medical school had been uh, in the movies? Was an actor? 
he was um, one of the little rascals. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> you know, and that was a big thing yeah, in the South. Wow. We had no, we had no, uh-huh. vi- see, California and Hollywood and all like that would be like, um, I don't know if the kids have anywhere like that now, you know, because the world, it seems so accessible. Yeah, but it was, was a lot more mystique. Yeah, it would be then. way, way exotic and way out with exotic people. I mean, and that's like just that. downright bizarre that one of the little rascals was the dean of the medical school. <laughs> he ended school. up being the dean of the medical school. <laughs> yeah. Extraordinarily prominent. But he was just a um, just a unique and cool person. You know, and anyway, it influenced me and, and some other people um, here and there. Uh, so I stayed in neurology. You know, these two had been in neurology and um, it was an academic thing, like it was indoors work and no heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Is uh, <laughs> not like on the dairy farm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'd learned that there's indoors and outdoors work. Uh, by the way, I've done almost a hundred. <laughs> I've, I've done almost a hundred <laughs> episodes of this podcast, and I can't tell you how many people that I've interviewed grew up on a dairy farm. Oh, really? It's this theme <laughs> that is running through this. Po- I think you're like the fifth or the really? sixth. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. That, anyway, that, that is interesting. I digress. Yeah, <laughs> that's got to be something. I don't know what that's got to be. Uh, maybe, you could, yeah, you can do one of those meta studies. Right. And, I'm going to, I think. Yeah. Um, so so then you so you hang out a shingle and start practicing yeah, medicine? I, oh, oh, yeah. I hit it. So I had to, um, I went in the, I finished my um, residency. I did two years at Emory Mm -hmm. and then three years of neurology at the University of Miami. And then I was in the Navy for two years. I had had signed a contract. Post-Vietnam? Vietnam had come to an end, yeah. Uh So were you ROTC then, or did they put you through Uh, medical school? No, it was a a kind of a special plan called the Berry Plan where you... um, you signed a contract in medical school that they'd let you finish your uh, training, then you'd give them two years later when you finished your training. Uh Uh And um, I was assigned to the hospital in Long Beach where Betty Ford and Mm. some of the others made famous uh, uh, years later. It was a two-story, either two or four, Mm -hmm. I can't remember. But I I was there for two years, and then that's all I had to do which to me it was just a fabulous experience. I mean, really being in the military. You like being in the navy. <laughs> I love. You're out, it was, it was, out on the boats or the know, shore leave part. It was just the you, you ran out the, the the camaraderie. I uh-huh. mean, it really is worth it just we, from the camaraderie. You were were you practicing medicine? Yeah, I was. Day, so. I was. I, I was the neurologist uh, that saw all mm-hmm. neurological patients between um, El Centro, which. I mean, uh, El Toro, which is about halfway up the road here to L.A., Mm -hmm. and then all the way up to Oakland. Mm -hmm. So I I saw a lot of Marines and people like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the hospital was, um, I'd say, it was a a real, real good medium-sized hospital Mm -hmm. with surgery and that type of thing but nothing real exceptional and when you when you were when you say you're the you were the main neurologist i mean were you were you were, surgery as well no no or no just, just neurology which okay. is uh, mainly uh, things like seizures and I and uh, strokes but not operating on spines or no, brain but surgery it, but or it, like the that. reason it was really cool is i had my i had a little office and i had two medics that mm-hmm. were working we had our um, it was like a little Having been, you know, in training my whole life, and then coming to this, it was just fabulous. Mm-hmm. It, it was it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I just had to remember what, you know, when to wear the white. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the two. So after that two years, you, do you stay in California? Yeah, yeah I stayed. In, I was in Long. I was living in Long Beach, which is close to there, uh-huh. where I was in the Navy, and um, I worked up there for three years in private practice with another man, another neurologist at one of the hospitals in Long Beach. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say at that time, I had almost lived the American dream. I had a house, and I had a car, and I, was a, I had clothes for the first time. I mean, nice clothes. Mm-hmm. 
and I had some prominence, and I drove to work, and and I had a white coat, and I did all that. So I kind of I got a good taste of what it was like to be a doctor in Long Beach, and um, I was still kind of a loner. That, that that's something that I've always been kind of a loner. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had rel- normal relationships along the way, but I was still living alone and this type of thing, and. Um, so, anyway, I reckon, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the listeners, you know, at this point. Like, <laughs> what? No, I don't think about them. Now, just tell your story, yeah, yeah. man. But um, I was alone, and I started, well, I, I started smoking a little marijuana here and mm-hmm. there. And um, began to have a few epiphanies, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh-huh. <laughs> Up until then, I'd been absolutely straight. You know, like, uh, I mean, I was like an eagle. Matter of fact, I was the youngest uh, Eagle Scout in the country. Really? Yeah. Wow. I got it in the minimum How amount old are you? of time. Um, I was 11, I think. Uh, 11? 12. You, yeah, wow, uh, when you got your Eagle Scout. Yeah, How many yeah. badges? It's like a yeah, ridiculous well, number. Well, it's just that you got to. You've got to really uh, work on it all the time to uh-huh. advance it. You can only advance it so fast. So it was a matter of seeing I could do it, do it and be the first one that never, uh, right, so right. at least at that so time. So clearly, you're this focused guy. I mean, when you set your mind to something, <laughs> first in your class, you know, until you start drinking beer with your buddies, but, you know, right, you right, scout right. and all this sort of thing, you're able to channel that side of your, you're, you're able to channel the non-zone when need be. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, looking back... I can see how, which, by the way, that was the part that I had the block on. As you get older, you advance kind of evolutionarily, okay? And um, I could see that in my past, I could have easily been a soldier or, or a military type, mm-hmm. not a, a sort of, some sort of killing person. But well, you're very regimented. Kind of regimented where it's just the world. You ignore the inside. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I can also see how I could have been a clerk uh, in a clerk variety, the the same mind state and, and this and that. Right, checking the boxes. Yeah, and, just kinda, and as I've gotten know. older, I've gotten closer to being, uh, you know, it would almost, it might be it, it, the little bit I know about Geronimo's life is that he started out kind of a hothead and he ended up being more rational and reasonable and wise at the end. But I might be wrong on that. But um, anyway, um, where was I? So you were talking about uh, basically that your your medical profession is progressing. You're starting oh, yeah, to have yeah, a good yeah, living, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, and then yeah, you start yeah, you start, uh, yeah, yeah, start yeah, smoking yeah. pot once in a while, and things are expanding or yeah, changing. Yeah, yeah, your yeah, perspective yeah, is yeah. starting to I shift. Remember, yeah, I was. See, <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, what I would say about is. Not, I was at least a prominent doctor at the second biggest hospital right. there in Long Beach. And um, I can remember driving to work and parking my car and looking back at the hood and thinking, like, why don't I paint some flowers on the hood? Of your car. Yeah. yeah. Now, I didn't do it, but I could just, I, I, I got into that mindset where I, um, that young people get into when they get exposed to marijuana. I never before that ever noticed cats. I'd never looked at jewelry. Mm-hmm. I never thought about. Um, I never uh, thought about the visual field in front of me as being a visual field as opposed to. I always thought it was a concrete world. Mm-hmm. You know, in other words, I I was, I sort of could see how. As a and by then I was credentialed and well thought of and everything as a doctor and a neurologist I was thinking like wow all that time I thought as a neurologist I knew about the mind I didn't know anything Hmm. and I was thinking like wow all of that education I was an English major at Duke and I read lots and lots of books and all along the way and all that I never had any insight into this way of looking at the world. 
and and so the first thing I did was get in touch with the Indian, the Hindus that mm-hmm. were working at the hospital, and um, they're pretty aware that there's another way of experiencing mm-hmm. the world. Um, but they they converted they had converted over to our way. So I was thinking like, wow, that might be what. Um, is going on with the mental institutions, you know, a lot of the uh, people that have mental problems and whatnot. Why don't I just quit and go into psychiatry mm. and see if I can find out for my own interest, really, because I, I wasn't married. I had no responsibilities except mm-hmm. myself. Um, what um, some of them are experiencing. And I, I got in um, the program down here, so I just quit my job up there and I came down here. Wow, you just stri- oh wow, so it's just like that. Yeah, yeah, I did mm-hmm. it pretty quick. Um, I mean, I have a friend down here that was able, that was kind of connected and he helped, but they had a position in, Down here being San Diego. Uh, UCSD, uh-huh. yeah. And um, I did t- I knew if I did two years I could be credentialed in psychiatry. Uh-huh. So you had to do a residency all I had to go back, so here I am a little bit of an older guy in the class, you know, but... Right. How old uh, were you at this point? Well, I'd gone through the Navy in two, three years, so I was probably about 30. Thir- oh, okay, so not yeah. that old. Uh, 31, right. maybe 32, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And I did two more years as a psychiatry resident down here, which, again, was just fantastic because of, of good people, uh, friends, and uh, the environment in San Diego. It was mm-hmm. such a nice place, but... Um, so all that, and then I figured halfway through that I'd stop marijuana cold. Okay, so I'd gone. Why'd you do that? You're you're starting to have all these epiphanies. You're going to paint the hood of your car, and <laughs> it's changing your career. So, and there must have been a dark side to that too to make you want to stop. You know what? <laughs> that's probably the most intelligent question you've asked. All right. <laughs> Looking back on it, that's where I made my big mistake. Okay. <laughs> you should have kept going. <laughs> I know. But I was a loner. See, I didn't smoke mm-hmm. with anybody. I didn't have any, uh, I didn't. But this is not what responsible doctors do, John. We know this, and, right? Uh, well, is yeah, that your that's fear it. of like. But, and that, oh, that, yeah. that was the other thing. Like it was a felony mm-hmm. uh, to be caught yeah, with marijuana. Yeah, it wasn't. Not, not like it is now. Yeah. But. And, um, yeah, so, but everybody, you know, it wasn't really, I mean, I didn't do anything uh, that was harmful. I mean, it would be like having an extra drink at, uh, right. on the weekend. Right, no, I, I got you, I got you. But, but anyway, I got down here, I'd stopped cold, and I was straight again, you know, real straight. And um, I decided to start a practice in neurology and psychiatry because no one down here was double credential that mm-hmm. way. Yeah, it's an interest. I mean, there, it seems a natural nexus yeah, yeah, between yeah, these yeah, two yeah. things. And it was so I started to practice in downtown, well, over in Hillcrest, which is Pill Hill, mm-hmm. and um, by myself, I had uh, it, I built up a nice little practice doing the um, pretty much standard neurology, and um, I got married, had a son. Got divorced about a little short of two years later after getting married. And I kept working, and my practice uh, kind of changed over to a lot of evaluations for disability and um, personal injury and things like that. Mm-hmm. So the quality of it changed. I began to make what I thought was a lot of money, and I bought up a, you know, bought an extra house and went mm-hmm. through that, you know, where I was kind of experiencing what it was like to have really good cars and mm-hmm. all that. Yeah, you got the, the, the V12 BMW, <laughs> right? Did you get the, you got a Ferrari? I got a, I had a, I had a Mondial Ferrari, which uh-huh. uh, it was the only one of its type. I mean, I thought it was a big deal. That was the first thing. Then that 12-cylinder, which is the worst car I ever had. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> well, I can tell you. Listen. I know. <laughs> and I do. I don't think I'm not a germanophile, but this, everything that they say about BMWs, a lot of it's true. Some of it's not true. 
but what I, f- I find out with this 12 cylinder, you'd be dry- flying along it at, at um, say, 45 miles an hour going down the street, and then suddenly it would just turn off. Oh, it, and go uh-huh. on. It would go on some sort of maybe two cylinders and and come to a stop. And there were a lot of glitches, other glitches mm-hmm. like that, and the wheels and it was. It I think was, they figured all that stuff out now. But I, <laughs> all right, but at the time, not so good, right? But at least it looked good, right? So you got the Mondial. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you get this exotic animal farm. Yeah, what is the yeah. story with that? Well, look, uh, yeah, well, I bought this place out in Ramona, up on top of a mountain looking down on everything, and it was a big house, a 6,000-square-foot house wow. with three stories, and it had this big wonder looking down on everything. I was thinking, like, whoa, this is really, like, I'm really turning into some sort of yeah, you're Faustian a, character. You're okay. a baller. <laughs> you know, I'm driving a Ferrari and doing all this. I got this thing, so I started buying all these damn, I, had, I got a, a couple of people working there for me, uh-huh. like foremen. And I, so I started buying all these damn exotic <laughs> damn birds. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and seriously, looking back on it, it's kind of funny. I would even, I even dress like you can tell people that go through this <laughs> phenomenon, whatever it is, of having more mm-hmm. money. Like a lot of the um, celebrities, you see them go through this. Well, they, they don't have anybody around them to tell them to cut it out, right? Like just a bunch of yes people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I started, like, I, I felt like the rest of y'all can wear a tie and a jacket like that, but I'm going to wear a special kind of jumpsuit. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're having, <laughs> like, your own Michael Jackson <laughs> yeah, Neverland yeah, Ranch exactly. situation? Yeah, exactly. Right. And this was, um, you know, I don't know if I did it before Michael Jackson or did it. He got the idea from you? I, or if he got the idea from me. <laughs> but I did I did see a connection there, you know. <laughs> anyway, um you know, it was a nice animal farm. We had uh, almost every kind of farm animal there, and I mm-hmm. had a, the best thing I had was a two hump uh, Bactrian camel, which wow. we gave eventually to the zoo, mm-hmm. and um, we smuggled him <laughs> a couple of. How do you that's, even that's do a story, that? That's a story. That's a story in it. So, well, it was. It, this is an interesting story. Um, I had. The guy working for me was from Oklahoma. He had grown up on the farm, farms and whatnot back there. And so I put out a, I had enough money where I could put out a, a notice that I was looking to for a camel, mm-hmm. you know, and I'd pay anybody that came up. Well, he. You put out the, how do you put out the notice for that? Like, how know, does that work? I, I didn't do it's it. It's like personally. a rich guy thing. Right? I know <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, listen, that's the, the part I was playing. Like, for instance, when I would go to an auction, I would sit on the front like J.R. Ewan. I was d- trying to be kind of like J.R. Ewan, uh-huh. and my um, foreman, who would a- dress one, down from me, so I was the prominent one. He mm-hmm. would sit there and and do the bidding. Okay, right. I would kind of like I I tried to do the whole thing. A little bit like, you know, I was, in a way, I was experimenting with the, the whole um, image thing, mm-hmm. I reckon. You know, the funniest, you got to get a chuckle out of this. I was putting together a small clinic, which never came, but it was in Vista. And I had some workers there, real nice people and educated people. And I drove over to see how it was coming in my Ferrari, okay? And I drove up to the building that we had bought it was a, a little building but it was um and it's two stories they're standing outside and i'm kind of dressed like in some sort of special jumpsuit <laughs> like my own version of elvis <laughs> <laughs> and they're standing there just thinking what a cool he's our boss he's just the coolest and they're standing there so i, I said a few things kind of like you know uh, kind of uh, superciliously and then uh-huh. i get back in the ferrari and back up and slam right into a post. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is knocking on your door already. It, it, yeah, that was that yeah, was the beginning of the, the zone. Is saying enough? <laughs> how much longer are we going to play this game? Yeah, Which exactly. Zone, you know? Well, now it it kind of taught me that you're talking about earlier the way you referred to this bigger uh, something uh, takes over yourself during sports, uh, mm-hmm. something like that. Like there's a higher creative self, whatever you call it. Well. It's taught me that, that there is a self like that, but there's another little man 
that's guarding a door that he comes through, and that little guy won't open the door mm-hmm. if he doesn't totally approve of what he sees mm-hmm. you doing. Okay, mm-hmm. it's like he would, and and so I was totally, I was willing to, for, so to speak. Well, I'll, if there is a God, I'll go to hell. You know, I was, I'd already kind of, it was a little bit like, well, I'm going to play it this way. Um, uh, in a way, in an analogy that um, I think in terms of now is how to bet if you had one uh, roulette wheel roll with 10 and you had to, uh, you had 10 chips. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was putting all my chips on black. But now I'm splitting my chips, five on red and five on black. Meaning what? Explain that. Um, all right. Thanks for asking me yeah. that. Um, I am absolutely a thousand percent devoted to the idea that there is a higher being of some kind that would make sense of this world that we're living in as humans. You could call that whatever it is God, okay? I'm totally devoted to the idea and the fact that mankind should strive in this direction as if he's an image and and built in that image. I totally disdain the other way of thinking Mm -hmm. that it's just a fluke. This is what science would tell us. This Mm -hmm. is a fluke and what people it's just now to get what you can and you're out of here there's no afterlife or anything like that on that side it seems to me that the left hemisphere which is the analytical hemisphere comes to that conclusion and it will always come to that conclusion mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> Dog, uh, Hawking just made a, a very good uh, TV series uh, program about why I don't believe in God, and he can, and he, by reason, he gives the most elegant argument. Who is this? Uh, Stephen Hawking. Oh, Hawking. Yeah, oh, okay. and it's All recent right. too. It's um, so, it's at the end, so to speak, his mm-hmm. final words on analysis. What, yeah. So, basically, if you think this way, and if you're trained this way. And then you know the psychology of denial and repression and all that kind of thing and how we're all tempted to fool ourselves. Um, You cannot ignore this whole part. And to me, that means that if you're balanced yourself on two feet, you will have about half doubt and about half devotion. I see. So that's that's the idea of half that, on black and half on. Yeah, red. yeah. The scientists um, and the uh, the uh, the typical sci- the pure scientist is putting all his chips on black. It's an interesting thing because it seems to me that the most brilliant of the scientists have to engage the right hemisphere of the brain because it requires some level of imagination and creativity. And to me, it's it's bizarre because if you really drill down to say quantum physics and you really begin to understand how matter uh, acts at the subatomic particle level, it's so baffling and so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't, you know, I'll I'll botch it, but subatomic particles that are, they're like mirror images of each other that could be, you know, on the opposite end of the earth that when one moves, right, the, right, other right, one moves right. the same way and all these kinds of crazy, it's crazy, right? So for me, when I look at that, that just gives me more room to believe right, that right, there's something right. greater, not less, you know? It's well, interesting. I agree totally with what you've said because if you follow quantum physics or any of it uh, down to it, if you really follow it down, it does that for me too, and probably ought to back up and say that, yeah, that the intelligent scientists, the intelligent scientists must see, for instance, these mm-hmm. uh, paradoxes in quantum physics. He must see 
that quantum physics that he believes has taught, been taught to believe in is no more than a temporary uh, imagination of the human mind. It's no further than the human mind. If you take the brain that produces the mind, at least according to what we think, you can hold it in your hand like this. Now, so the scientist has got to say, if that's the fundamental level, if he's really understanding it at that level, and it's not just a temporary looking, a temporary uh, imagination of, of the mind, because it's, then he must be thinking that something that that size, and that looks like a cabbage, can comprehend the 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 right. under the underpinning of the universe now think what how that diminishes the extent to which the universe in other words you would think that if a brain could comprehend the true quantum physics that it really exists i mean if it could really i mean way beyond the mathematics that we know now and all that just way 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 so it really is right on it mm -hmm. That brain would have to be extraordinary. Be a bit big. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what it what what it says to me is that is that we as human beings are extremely arrogant in this idea that we believe you know we're at the top of the food chain and that we're capable of understanding everything and it's and it's that it's that um, mindset that pushes us forward to continually expand and develop technologies and all of this, but I think that it bears. It, you know, it bears recognizing that we may never be able to understand these That's things right. in the yeah. same way that you could pick up a snake and try to teach that snake how to understand the human language for the rest of your life. And that the brain in that snake is not, it's just not right, advanced right, enough right, to understand right. that no matter what you do. And so right. I think we need to understand that we're quite possibly missing that extra lobe or two that would, that would allow us to comprehend these things. That's I mean, right. our ability to perceive is so limited from the you know the auditory frequencies that are, we're able to pick up on through the visual spectrum that we're able to perceive all these sorts of things are extremely limiting and so for us to say oh well you know it's it's this or that and that's the definitive yes or no i think is extremely arrogant and and i think it 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 hamstrings us from being able to uh, be in that place of of wonder where we can allow that imagination to flow and to really contemplate and embrace the idea that there is more out there and to be okay with that. That's not a threat to our, you know, time on the mortal coil. Yeah, I like the, I like mm -hmm. everything you just said. I agree totally. So, all right, so <laughs> so so you're driving the Ferrari, you got the crazy <laughs> ranch with all the animals and yeah. <laughs> and everything's yeah. going good. I mean, what's going on spiritually at this time in your life or emotionally i mean are you starting to kind of question what's going on or are you having that rich guy thing where you're thinking hmm. why am i not as happy as i thought this would make me or what is going on with you well um i believe that i the next thing that started to happen was gradual and that was a loss of my vision mm -hmm. so and how long after this, this sort of you know collecting the crazy animals did that start to creep in um probably Oh boy, I don't know. It, it, it just back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I can I can tell you that I can remember for about a year when I would look. It seemed like everything was real dim, and um, I'd seen an ophthalmologist a few times for uh, to correct my glasses before ski season. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he told me that I was almost blind. Hmm. That uh, according to the way they define it, hmm. it not according. But and I was thinking to myself, and I even told him. <clears throat> I think it was during the Clinton administration. I was just thinking that yeah. the Democrats are making too many advances. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, well, if you this thought is that helicopter was coming after you after you. <laughs> no. No, no, no. That was really kind of funny that it was coincidental because I really did think, well, golly, if I'm disabled then um, and, and legally blind, 
that means that uh, Clinton and the Democrats have really made a lot of advances in Congress. That I'm <laughs> You're starting to lose it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I was thinking that they've lowered the threshold of the disability so far. Right. But um, it was kind right. of a joke because I enjoyed skiing you're, so you're much. You're driving around and <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, living yeah. your life and you're yeah. able to function. But, but then I, I, when I was um, practicing um, this uh, forensic neurology, I started I, noticing that I couldn't really tell if I'd seen somebody before or not. Mm -hmm. So um, I got my eyes checked by a bunch of doctors and they all kind of agreed that there was a a problem with optic atrophy mm -hmm. uh, resulting from a, a severe case of drusen um, crystals, which is a some kind of condition that people get occasionally. And um, so I, I, I said, well, gosh, my business is going down and I'm, um, I qualify, you know, I'm kind of getting older anyway. I'm unmarried. I got I don't have any mortgages. So I just put it all together and figured, like, well, I'll just um, change, you know. And I like. There had to be some level of profound unhappiness or dissatisfaction going on with you oh, I concurrently can, yeah, with that yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to really make you want to change that drastically, though, at the time. It must have been. Because it, it's almost. It, on some level, okay, you know, you're going to have trouble practicing medicine with this condition. I mean, is it was it really prosopagnosia? Is that is that how they? That's the, that's what they you right, call it. Which um, is the condition where you can't you have difficulty. Recognizing I think I could. I think I could have continued, um, but so there had to be some. There there was a momentum going yeah, on where yeah. this this you know, this opportunity. It's almost exactly. an opportunity presented itself where it said, "Now I can finally." His his. Uh, I, I don't know if you saw this documentary they made on this, but there were, the turning point that I can identify was a um, an old man that I saw in the cafeteria mm -hmm. uh, in the hospital when I was at the kind of at the top part of working every, hard as a regular doctor, and I had mailed off to him about uh, how does a a young, good-looking, strapping guy like mm -hmm. me get to be some old gnarly character like he is. Right, he's like 91 years he old, He was 90-something, right? mm -hmm. yeah. And he just, he turned and shouted at me, I'll do what you want to. Now, that was in the setting of me knowing almost everything that an average doctor should know about what's a good diet, what's uh, the right thing to do for this medicine, I mean, this particular disease, What? how much do you do this? What? I'd gone through a society where everything was given to me of what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the first time in my life that I'd ever thought, gosh, if a person just does what he wants to, for instance, maybe bacon, if I really like to eat bacon, maybe in my case... It's what I should be eating, you know. And, and I was thinking it changed the whole direction. I was thinking, like, there, there's all this, as you know, the uh, philosophic agreement that, man, there's a certain cat set of categorical imperatives inside of us. And um, instead of, and I saw medicine as being like a, a bell-shaped curve where they were um, a taking everybody to be the same mm -hmm. um, and for instance and it was just so obvious in neurology because we expect this nerve to innervate that particular finger and so mm -hmm. on um, but then I was thinking like whoa if I just did exactly what I wanted to what I really wanted to really wanted to and um Maybe it would guide me down a road where at the end I would be healthier and happier than I would have been if I had tried to travel down the road that I heard that you should eat this and you should do mm -hmm. this and maybe you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't think this kind of thought and blah, blah, blah. It just goes forever. You know? Right. Um, so having all, having all that knowledge of here's how you eat and live to be healthy and happy inside 
you're not happy. I mean, in That's the documentary, right. yeah. you, you're self-described asshole, right? Yeah, right. I mean, and well, is that just in your, you're in your ego and in your arrogance and driving your Ferrari around yeah, yeah, and yeah, disdain yeah. for your yeah, patients? Yeah. And <laughs> right. uh, um, yeah, yeah, kind of. Mm-hmm. Really, just um, <laughs> yeah, it was a kind of a Faustian thing. I can remember. Um, I think it, I I experienced the same thing that Faust did. Mm-hmm. Um, but Faust didn't get a way out. You know, I I've been meaning to check on that. Uh, yeah, I should. Die. It's been a while. I don't want to name my speaking out of school on that. Did he? No. <laughs> but, but I think you know when you talk about Faust, you talk about literature. When I look at your the arc of your life, it really is. It really is. You could not. A great writer couldn't script these dichotomies and these, uh, these you, you know, sort of the character arc better. It's almost too good to be real because you have, you ha- you're starting to lose your eyesight, but that gives you the ability to see. You're a neurologist, and then you suffer from this neurological disorder that you would think imprisons you as a result of your many years of being a doctor, and yet that's what sets you free. And you're this loner who enjoys his time alone and it develops this condition which you would think would isolate you further and that's what's created greater community for yourself, you know. And this idea that, uh, that you stared at the end of your, you were staring at the end of your career, but that's really where your life began. It's beautiful, you know, and you couldn't, you couldn't dream that up. If you wrote it down, somebody would say, well, that's fiction. Well, you put it together mighty beautifully. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you seeing it that mm-hmm. way. I, uh, where I'm at now, um, I live here a half a block from the boardwalk. It's a two-mile stretch of perfect skating. The feeling that I get when I skate, I know is the zone. I can get in the zone very easily that way and sustain it. My thoughts when I'm skating a spirit, the type that people naturally have when they're in the zone, the way I relate to the people and what they see up and down the boardwalk. So it really is a, about as close to paradise. Mm-hmm. It's next. I live next to the zone in a way. But the paradise isn't geographical for you. The paradise is is your ability to live within this zone-like state that you're able to access through what you do every day, which is get out and skate and high five people and listen to music and tap into, you know, that more primal part of who you are that allows you to connect with, you know, your higher state of consciousness. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I call it um, the way I visualize it. And and I can tell you, you understand all this type of stuff, is that the ego is in a room that has a, a little door and in front of that door is a very small little soldier who is you when you were five years old before the left hemisphere began to take over Mm -hmm. he knows right and wrong he knows uh when a person's arrogant and when they're not he knows a person uh, the way everything should be and he watches you now, you have to please him, otherwise he won't open the door. Now, when he opens the door, you just call it the primal uh, part of ourselves. I call it, the Christians call it the Christ. I think that's mm-hmm. what they mean by the Christ. Um, the, um, I call it, because I, I don't want to restrict it, I think the Christ is a good name for it, but so that people don't get hung up on whether or not that's correct, is the fundamental man. Because I think the spirit is the same thing that exists. If if there is a man that's equal, if we are equal, it's the the fundamental man is Mm -hmm. the thing, okay? And if he's in us equally, I guarantee you he's in the birds and in the animals, and um, he, but he only comes out and manifests himself in the when a person's in the zone, and that's mm-hmm. when that little guy, 
agrees to let him to it safe, and he comes into the the, the um, fundamental Christians would probably say that this is you have to invite Christ into your life. This is the the idea is that you have to behave in a, such a way that this happens to you. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that that uh, that that sense of higher consciousness is always there um, but but you have to do something active to tap into it whether mm-hmm. it's skating or meditation or any variety of things right. um, mm-hmm. you know it's sort of that idea that that you know God never leaves you you leave God it's, it's always there and mm-hmm. whatever your concept of of that higher power is for yourself um, you found a very specific and unique way of accessing it, your own personal, you know, brand of tapping into it, which is fascinating. Uh, but in many ways, it's it's your version of accessing a meditative state that allows you to be a more actualized version of yourself. And, you know, the biggest theme of this podcast is how to unlock and unleash your best, most authentic self. So you call it the fundamental man. I sort of, I generally refer to it as the, as a more actualized version of, of yourself, but I think it involves that right. regression of tapping into that childlike nature that exists within all of us that gets worn away over the years. All right, let me repressed. inject right here. Please the, do. The way you do it is you do what you want to. In other words, that, that, self will find Mm -hmm. its way like water unless you restrict it and if there's some barrier for instance um, if you get to a um, you have to learn what you really want to do how much do you really want to eat how much do you really want to sleep how much do you really want to be this person or that person or be this and that and just gradually cone down on it and what that will do is prepare you it will open it, the, the, that path will it, unfold that's right. for yeah. you well I have a couple observations on that and the first thing is that uh, I might write down a note because I don't want to forget but the first idea is that most people are so disconnected from themselves that when you sort of beckon them to ask themselves what it is that they want or sort of tell them, go do what you want. Most people don't even know what that is. And and it's not their fault. It's because it's because this, uh, the non zone, as you call it, or our culture has created a situation where we're, we are disincentivized from tapping into that part of our life and, and it's not considered acceptable or okay. And we're, you know, in all honesty, most people are just trying to get through the day. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to take care of their kids. They got to pay the bills. And, and who has time to entertain this notion of, of you know, what makes me happy or, or what it is that I that I want to do. Um, and so I think that pushes buttons when you say just do what you want to do. I think the knee jerk kind of reaction is well. Mm-hmm. Good for you, slow mo. You know, you had a you had a nest egg, and you know it's all fine and dandy. But like, I don't have a nest egg. You know, I don't have that luxury. And you know, my my story arc isn't as dramatic as yours, but it has been a journey towards that uh, trying to you know tap into the fundamental mm-hmm. man and doing you know what I want to do. And uh, mm-hmm. I walked away from a law career. You know, it's not it's not in certain respects the themes are the same. Um, and my response to that is generally. You know, I'm not. I'm not telling people to go out and be irresponsible, but you've got to find a way to connect with yourself and start to d- cultivate a better relationship, a healthier relationship with yourself, so that those ideas of what you may want to be or may want to express more fully start to um, percolate up, and then your life can be about trying to find, at first, subtle ways of expressing that more. And as you walk that path as we just said you know that path will get laid out and those bricks will f- start to fall in front of you and it's a matter of following that lead I, th- I think you've spoken it very well but I want um, to yeah please it, it, like, go ahead for, for someone listening <laughs> right now saying because <clears throat> I'd be the first to say that Beavis was very wise when he told Budhead there's always a catch <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, That's your sound bite. <laughs> but but I, I, want, I want to say something to the people that might be listening uh, on this idea that you should um, you have to be responsible and make money and, and, go and put food on the table. One of the things that surprised me personally is how much people liked me more when I was pleasing myself mm -hmm. than when I was trying to please them. It's that, it's that Buddhist idea of the best way to heal the world is to heal, heal yourself. yourself. Exactly. It sounds selfish and self-indulgent, but right. there's a great truth in that. Let's, let's take an example. Like, um, I can visualize someone listening to one of your broad, this broadcast mm -hmm. um, is struggling to make enough money to put uh, say, give his family some stuff or something. <coughs> but if he doesn't really want to do that, okay, if there's something else that he really <laughs> wants to do and he does it instead, has the courage to do it instead, then what will happen is his family will be happier because he's happier doing something that he really wants to do. Now, the, the problem is... He may think he wants to do one thing, and he really doesn't. You've got to know what you really want to do because society has programmed you in such a way that you figure, like, well, if I really want to do that, it's got to be wrong, mm -hmm. okay? You've got to be careful uh, to really know what you want to do. A lot of people, um, Ezra Pound said that if you were honest, uh, the only things you'd really want to do is make love and lie around. <laughs> 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 yeah. you know? Well, it, it, cause it, but the point of that, extrapolating on that point really, is that the things that, that make us happy are incredibly simple that that you think, well, that that can't be it. Like for me, <laughs> yeah, that's it. I yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. the sun is coming out right now. I yeah. feel the sun on my cheek and that makes me happy or being out on a trail with the sun on my back and, and being able to connect with my breath or being, you know, in the ocean swimming. These are the things that make me genuinely happy. And I remember as I started to engage those more, I thought that's kind of great. This is what kids do. This can't be, you know, what it is. But you know, we're hardwired with millions of years of DNA to, you know, live in a more primal state than we've created for mm -hmm. ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, you're an example of what it, what happens when you can connect with that kind of primal urge and, and the direction that that can lead you in. But I think it does go back to exactly what you said, which is you got to get right with yourself. You know, we're, we're, we're so bombarded with signals and distractions and information that it's impossible to be silent with yourself to be able to tap into the frequency of that that higher consciousness that is trying to speak to you and it's work you know that doesn't happen just because or you can't just flick a switch like you have to put energy and time into that in order to ensure that whatever decision you do make about where you're going to invest your time in the future in a way that will make you happy is indeed the appropriate path for you. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. resonate with what where you're coming from? Yes. Um, it's all in the word want. What does, you know, it's interesting mm -hmm. like, because the words are applying to um, something that's very hard to, to know, really. Mm -hmm. What does a person really want? Um, well, that, that's the, it's subjective. It's, it's purely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I reckon um, you're talking about um, that we're wired a certain way. One way you could say that this thing may be working is that <clears throat> biologic tissue has to it get to a certain stage of development to create a mind, like a to have a brain with a mind. And then the mind has to get to a certain uh, uh, a stage of, of evolvement or evolution to um, produce what we would call the zone, okay? And the zone um, is a natural, uh, the result of a natural evolution so that... Um, 
Well, look, give you an example. In the TV series, it's excellent, called The Vikings. I don't know if mm-hmm. you've seen that. It's very... I have a friend on that show, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, good uh-huh. for him. Which one is he? Uh, his name's Donal Logue. I, I don't know the name of his character. Uh, okay, he's, okay. he's a bearded guy with long hair, but they all are, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. which guy. I haven't watched the show well, yet. But it's sorry, very, Donal. It, it, according to the archaeology uh-huh. and whatnot, it's very accurate. It's is a it? good program. Uh-huh. And um, you can tell that they're hierarchy. They First off, they're, uh, and, and this would be true of the Nordic cultures, that they were extremely... Uh, loyal to law mm-hmm. that they really were na- they were societies uh that believed in the law the law of nature or no what, no the, their law their law okay. they, 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 it wasn't as uh they weren't societies of men all right below the i mean even the chief and people like that had to obey the law and then in the hierarchy there was a chieftain that we're all the warlord that we're all familiar with mm-hmm. but above the warlord was the mystic and the mystic was the only one that there was no reprisal against you couldn't mm-hmm. kill the mystic i mean warlords had to defend mm-hmm. themselves the mystic so. had tenure <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> exactly the mystic all right so if if you look at the uh, bible the hierarchy is the mystic mm-hmm. the top if you look at um Something Native like, Am- well, Native American cultures. Native similar, American or, culture. That's right. The mystic, so the, the mystical part of India. the personality, we think, is the top. And we care less about animals that we think don't and have that. If we think a dog's got it, we don't eat dogs over here because we think that a lot of people think that there's a heaven for human. There's going to be dogs in there because they're not any less divine than we are. Mm-hmm. And so... Basically, the the idea is um, that the mystic, whatever his desires are and whatever he thinks, that this is the top. And I, I don't mean the epileptic. I'm talking about the true mystic. Mm-hmm. Um, and that those things are very consistent with what all the biblical and ancient writings have said even Marcus Aurelius and people like that. Um, <clears throat> and that is what we really want, most of us, is uh, peace of mind. Uh, aggression and revenge are attractive, as are the deadly sins, the seven deadly sins. All of them are attractive to all of us. But a state of peace and goodwill and love is preferred. That's mm-hmm. the one we want. Mm-hmm. And I think that we're all chasing it, but we're chasing it in the wrong way. Which because way? we're in a, a world where we think that the way to get that is to sort of, you know, succeed in our modern right, definition right, right, of the right, term. Right. And then we get there and then we think, what happened? or what's wrong, or why aren't I not feeling the way that I thought that I would feel when I got mm-hmm. here? And then you feel ripped off, mm-hmm. and then you feel resentful, and that can lead you down a very dark path of despair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you found a way out. <laughs> found a way so out. So I want to know, did you just have this epiphany and literally overnight sell all your stuff? I mean, what was the logistics of how that all went down? Um. Well, I quit, and I started doing exactly what I wanted. I mean, mm-hmm. I, that was my theme every day. I, um, I, everything fell into place so nicely. It seemed like to me like it was a gift from God to mm-hmm. get me out of my medical state. Mm-hmm. My, um, I mean, did business. so you had this ninety-one-year-old gentleman says, "Do what you want." And did you kind of ruminate on that for oh, a yeah, while? Absolutely. Or how long was it before absolutely. you just decided? Yeah, yeah um, I did. I mean, I started doing it immediately. I started mm-hmm. doing what, what I want. I, I would, um, of course, I felt guilty as I'll get out. For the first few years, I remember when I would wake up, I could hear the freeway, thinking like mm-hmm. I should be on the freeway. You know, after a while, you don't hear the freeway anymore, the distant sound of the freeway. Mm-hmm. Um, and what are your uh, your peers, your colleagues, your... Extended family members. 
chir- well, chirping into your ears <laughs> around this time. I've, um, well, almost everybody thought I was probably uh, nuts or mm-hmm. was, I was sort of semi nuts. Um, some of my family members kind of politely came out and visited me and to see do an what, intervention. <laughs> yeah, that type of thing. Right. Um, the uh, I mean, it never really came to the surface, and and I never could tell at a point like that. You, there's always you have a streak of paranoia, so you don't know for sure, you know, just how how much a, a person is sort of evaluating your the level of your mental mm-hmm. faculties. Well, it's a tricky thing <clears throat> because I think the dividing line between dementia and expansion or the quest for enlightenment, those it's like a Venn diagram that perhaps could overlap, and especially the way that we perceive somebody who makes a counterculture decision to be, you know, for lack of a better term, a seeker. That's not something that's going to be embraced. That's something that's going to be marginalized. And and uh, and kind of the words that would come out of the mouth of that person can sound crazy to somebody else when, in fact, maybe these are the, the words that we should all be heeding. Well, to me, I know both sides. I think it's like combat. You've got in the middle third of life, you, you cannot always do what you want to. Mm-hmm. You have to make a living. And uh, that, there's some realities there. I mean, we have to survive. And, but if you get a chance, as much as you can, I think you ought to stay in contact with the other side, the zone of what I think Christ called the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. It's inside you. And you should get... Uh, uh, try to call back some small part of a day or a week to be um, in touch with that so that later you can get you can just dive right into it and be in that state as much as possible when you're older yeah I mean in the documentary you say that you were lost in a rational world it's a rational and, world and, yeah. the, and the question that you were asking yourself is on a daily basis how much of your life was devoted to spirituality and how much of your life was devoted to financial gain. And when that balance tipped too far in the wrong direction, that's really when you started asking yourself these questions. And the universe, I guess you could say in certain respects, really conspired to answer that question for you. It did. I, I, I feel like I'm in therapy sometimes. You, uh-huh. you summarize these things so perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is really helping me understand Good, I'm myself. glad. But we haven't even gotten to the skating <laughs> yeah. part, right? Like uh, in the top 50 things of, you know, like what makes me happy? Like where does mm-hmm. the how, – how do you – you know, how does it boil down to putting on the rollerblades? I mean, at some point you must have been doing this already yeah, yeah, where yeah. you realize this is something that made you happy. But where does it – where does the – the sort of dawning realization come in that this is literally what you want to just basically do all day, every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, yeah, There's a song mm-hmm. where the lyric um, is, if I were a rich man, <clears throat> I would pray all day. Uh-huh. That's in uh, Fiddle on the Roof. If I were a rich man, right. I'd spend all day praying. Well, I'd identify that the, uh, the best state of mind, and, and we're all no different states of mind. Uh-huh. But the best for me was what I call the top spiritual state of mind, uh, or the zone. And that I discovered when I was skiing. I'm taking a picture of okay. you. Yeah. I, I discovered Sorry, when I was skiing, uh, it, uh, I, I would go skiing every winter. Oh, whoops. Hold on. Do and, that one more time. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> New uh, film there. I got to take so, a Polaroid of so all I, I guess. So I knew I'd done enough skiing over the years that I knew uh-huh. that the sliding, um, and I'd v- investigated this lateral acceleration or momentum um, gives a certain feeling that the reason people get it, the feeling of exhilaration on carnival rides or racing around a corner in a mm-hmm. car. Um, is the that acceleration expands the inner the experience of inner the inner ear experience of balance. It's the side, so it's the side to side motion. Really. Yeah, it's the side. Sort of it, it's got to be a force. Feel, That's right? right. It's got to be a force. Um, it's uh, neurologically, it activates a whole nother set of receptors. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'd experimented with this over the years with skiing, so that at the top of the hill. 
I would get as close as I could meditatively by standing there. And then um, I would I'd kind of gauge the size and the extent of this. And then I would, when I was uh, carving turns, I would uh, see that it got much larger mm-hmm. and more intense. Okay, so it it dawned on me that the that this was the source of, uh, for instance, when Hillary they asked Hillary why he climbed mountains. I Sir dare Edmund s- Hillary. Yeah, not Hillary Clinton. <laughs> no, um, so, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, as you know, he said because they're there. Mm-hmm. But there's a real answer to that question. The real reason has to do with balance. When a person is in a precarious um, situation, for instance, climbing the wall of a mountain or something like that, the sense of balance expands. Mm. And what that is... It's, and at least in my own judgment, the identical thing which the um, Moses and the other people that wrote the first part of the old Bible call the I am experience. Mm-hmm. In other words, the soul and the sense of balance are identical to each other. That's what I'm saying. Interesting. Yeah, so the meditator, what he's doing is he's concentrating on part of the the, uh, sense, uh, the sensory apparatus for balance, which pl- wants to plumb mm-hmm. itself with the sun of the earth. Yeah, there's, there's, well, this idea of I am kind of harkens back to Hindu texts and the idea of self and oneness right, right. And being present right. and meditation techniques that that revolve around doing doing just that anchoring right. yourself like envisioning that that anchor dropping down from uh, the base of your spine when you're in that lotus right, position right, right. all the way okay, to the center yeah, yeah. of the earth. So okay, so mm-hmm. Buddha could do that really. It's assume that he could really do it well. Mm-hmm. Now he's got, Buddha, his inner, he's got his inner ear dialed in, right. right? He's got it dialed in <laughs> to the center of the earth. Now suppose he had had inline skates or a teacup at Disneyland. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Uh-huh. His meditative experience would have gotten larger. That's what happens to all the people that are that get addicted to these sliding sports. For instance, the surfer, mm-hmm. the skateboarder, surfing, skiing, on and on. It's the exhilaration of the I am experience, which results from adding the acceleration component, that is the force component, to the um, the stable component that's plumbed to the sun of the earth. So what is it neurologically that's going on in the inner ear that allows you to kind of experience that, like neurologically? Um, Okay, here's what I, the, the way, it, from my knowledge of, of the anatomy and so on, and it, it, it's incredibly a lot of details. Right, uh, which is for well. the layperson. But the layperson, if you look at the brain, you can remember that a big part of the brain is the lower part, the cerebellum. Mm-hmm. It's about a third of the size of the, of the rest of the brain, the major part of the brain. The cerebellum is wired primarily into uh, the inner ear, okay, and to some extent, to a large extent, and a sort of a parallel system, which is at the tip of the nerves, that is a proprioceptive sense, mm-hmm. all right? The, um, that part of the brain uh, picks up information from the inner ear, from the uh, semicircular canals and from the otoliths which are plumbed to the center of the earth on both sides mm-hmm. and there's a background feeling which we call the sense of balance it's the sixth sense it's the same sense that the ancients would call thought existed in the pineal gland the neurologists don't make any identity of the sense of balance with the I am experience, mm-hmm. but meditatively, if you 
watch it from the inside while you change your sense of balance and you know that this is what they're doing, or at least it's consistent with what they're doing when they meditate. And then how much of our sports have to do with acceleration. And then the feeling of the zone and you put it all together. It's a state of epiphany. It's a state of I exist as a subjective entity I am what I am, which is this. Now, what this is, is the result, at least if we go back to a scientific way of looking at it, of these receptors stimulating part of the brain, which as a uh, result of curved space Mm -hmm. or gravity or gravity waves. And um, these... uh, waves, obviously most of them are coming from the sun of the earth, from the gravity of the earth, but most, uh, but a certain number come from out of, uh, from the sun and the moon. And uh, it has a constant uh, background, it's a little bit like micro background act uh, mm-hmm. of, of the mind. For instance, we, we have six senses, you can count them. Sight is a, is a predominant one. When you see something, this sixth sense is, is just there. Right, okay. it's on low hum. The right. sixth it's sense, on the low sense hum. of balance you is You hear it's something, an it's on low hum. Right. It, it, you smell and eat something, it's on low hum. You go through life as if it didn't exist. Well, it doesn't, the sense of balance never really gets lumped in with the other senses. That's we right. Don't, it really, That's we right. don't really acknowledge right. it as one of our senses. That's right, because it, it is identical to us that's what i'm thinking is it what well, you've right, taken, because you wouldn't know what it would be like to be you can't be born without a sense of balance yeah i mean you can have yeah. a tweaked sense of balance i suppose but you you couldn't be born without what it feels like to feel gravity right so we wouldn't know what, we it, wouldn't. what that would be like and there's no you know? place in the universe where there's no absolutely no gravity mm. um i think that uh you can tell that it it will accommodate to itself. Like if you go spin in a circle after a certain period, you'll you'll come it'll it'll con- balance, come out. balance out. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it by what I can uh, it's experience and watch is that there's sort of a limit of time of how long a person can literally stay glued in the zone mm-hmm. in a in a epiphanous state like from acceleration, okay, and it's a matter of a few minutes, probably. But in essence, what you're saying is that, is that by, by uh, engaging your body in these lateral movements that you, you can access through rollerblading or surfing or skateboarding or what have you, it's really just a means to access a state of higher consciousness exactly. that would be a little bit more work if you were just meditating. So it's almost like it, it does the work for you so you're not fighting your mind trying to get into that state. It's just a natural result of the motion that you're putting your body through. Exactly. And that allows... So it's a, it's a moving meditation for you. Yeah, that's right. And right. That, that takes us back to the idea that, that the athletes fundamentally the same group of people that were worshiping in other forms in other in other mm. words they are what they're doing when they get addicted and they do it fanatically it's a type of worship it's identical to the same feeling that a person would get on sunday if he went and sat quietly in a church or a synagogue or something like that mm-hmm. it's that um fundamentally that's that's it's uh, that's got to be the unifying. If there's anything that unifies religions and gets any follower in whatsoever, it would have to have a component of it would have to be the same state of mind. Right. Well, it's that is definitely the unifying thread yeah, through yeah. through every you know aspiration. The of, athlete here is finding, and he is also, and that that's what I'm saying is in that category. He doesn't mm-hmm. think of himself as being a worshiper. But if you really look at it and thinking that's what he's doing, he's a monk. When you, mm-hmm. the, the, that's what I was just going to say. I was going to say you, you're actually you you live a very monk like existence, like incredibly simple, and you you wake up and your day is about devotion. 
It right? is. It's yeah, yeah. By engaging in this meditative state of higher consciousness. I, I live for it. And when I'm not in it, um, I'm literally just waiting to die. Like, um, I can see what the average doctor I observed that I knew that retired lived two years and then died. Mm. Usually because, at least the way doctors have been up until recently, maybe they still are, they really didn't have much of a life other than just working away as a doctor. That mm -hmm. was their whole thing. So they were totally unprepared to be anything except maybe a, to drink, you know, mm -hmm. at the last. I, I think that... Um, I think marijuana is a better choice than drinking, uh. <laughs> you know, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I think you can, I think uh, what I found out, and I'll put in a plug for this, if anybody's still listening to this prod podcast. Oh, they're listening. I've, I've um, experienced uh, life to, I'm 71, and I've seen this right and wrong and what's sin and what's ethical. I, I can, i mm -hmm. taken a good look at all that. And um, I can wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to jog your memory. Yeah, jog my memory. So here. you were talking about uh, accessing a higher state of consciousness. Oh, and... oh, yeah, yeah. You're back on the, here's the ethical system. Mm -hmm. Assuming that this model of the mind is right. Okay, generally right. The ethical system is that everybody should, if they can, maintain and, and take care of one sin. I think we were meant to have one sin or one vice. For instance, smoking cigarettes would be considered a vice. Smoking marijuana is a vice. Indiscriminate sex, uh, frequent sex is a, a vice. Uh, all gluttony is a vice on and on and on all these people that have lived before us they were right these are vices now part of us does well if we have one vice we cherish it mm -hmm. we take care of it so I, I'm getting an idea of what your vice is yeah <laughs> your life will fall apart yeah. if you add a second vice or a third vice as a physician, I've never seen an alcoholic who had only one vice have any problem. I've never seen a smoker that had only that vice have a problem. I've never even seen a heroin addict or an amphetamine addict who had only that particular thing. The point is, I think that we can all live longer if we have one vice and we perfect it, but not add two. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't need a vice, you can be judgmental, and that counts as a vice. Well, I don't think anybody's without vice on some level. My you point know, is to have only one and yeah. perfect it. But why not, why not work to try to overcome all your vices? Imperfectly, of course. We're human beings. We're going to err. We're going to, you know screw up and all these sorts of things, but why not commit yourself to always be trying to be better? Well, that's a, uh, there's no reason not to, if that's what you want to do. But I, um, there's a couple of things in favor of having one vice. Mark Twain identified the first one, that is, you have something to stop <clears throat> <laughs> well, you, <laughs> if you start right. feeling too bad, okay? Uh -huh. Or if the doctor tells you you've got to stop. There's always that you, one last thing. That yeah, you can one last right. thing you can do. Now, it also gives you something to do in the last part of your life. You can think to yourself, do I have enough time left that would justify changing my vice? And this is a worthy topic of your own existential in other words, the question you ask to stop a vice is a lot more interesting than to be a person who doesn't have a vice to, that decides maybe to start one. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, like I said, I think we all have we all have our vices in one form or another that are you know ramped up to whatever volume they're at. But I don't think there's anyone walking the planet who's who's vice free, <clears throat> you know, completely. Yeah. Um, and I think the people that are 
the most judgmental about other people's vices are probably harboring secret vices of their own that they don't want other people to know about. Uh, I don't know how we got down this tangent. Well, but, um, I think that having one, the, the main thing I tell the young people out here, <clears throat> I try to get through them seriously. The point is, <clears throat> because they're drinking, smoking, right. doing everything. <clears throat> the, the, what they need to do is come down on one vice and just do one because the person, so their own life won't deteriorate. Right, but I think that, that <clears throat> I mean, what if your one vice is crack cocaine? You know, it's not, that's not going to end well. I bet. You know? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think that's a purely hypothetical. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been a person who had only that particular vice. <clears throat> he probably had several vices, uh -huh. and there may be an exception to this. But but I think that, uh, for instance, there have been people that function quite well on amphetamines, um, but they use it, the ones that get in trouble drink and use amphetamines. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're yeah, I mean if you're <clears throat> if you're an addict, you're an addict, and the addict in well, I'm I'm in recovery, I have been for years, um, but I know you know one truth, which is that. You know, just because I'm not drinking doesn't mean that the addict isn't alive and well yeah, looking yeah, for yeah. something else to latch on to. So that's that's where the work is. All right. Now, my, my question to you and I, uh, is, would be, have, if you don't have any vices at this time, would you be happier to select another vice that was not maybe destructive as, as uh, alcohol and then have that, in other words, and I'm not asking if you have any vices. Uh -huh. I have plenty, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but, well, anyway, it's like I, I think that, um, in other words, I'm putting a plug in for one vice. Everybody mm -hmm. should take it uh, consider because if you have no vices, you are isolated from the best part of humanity. You have a tendency to be judgmental, which is mm -hmm. uh, the worst as I said, you turn into an asshole. Well, I think another way of putting that really is just to say to to embrace uh, the imperfections of what it means to be human and to yeah, understand exactly, that none exactly, of us are yeah. perfect and to not and to not be hard on yourself because you're not perfect or holding yourself up to some kind of impossible standard and to you know really just try to enjoy your life a little bit more. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. um, but getting back to the skating, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. got to talk about that a little bit more. So what I want to know is, uh, I want to know, like, what's, what's a typical day in the life? Well, I <clears throat> get up about 9, 9 o'clock mm -hmm. or something like that, have drink coffee, mm -hmm. <clears throat> watch the news. Uh, why are you doing that? That's not monk-like. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be watching the news. You're poisoning your brain. I know. I, I've always been addicted yeah, to, I'm one of those people, and I and I I know the virtue of of stopping paying attention to the, mm -hmm. all that, but I still I I love history, and I love the, I, frankly, it comes under the heading that I can't see when people say God loves man. I always thought that might be stretching it, like there's nothing that lovable about man. But I could see God being fond of us because there are things about man, for instance, politics, that I'm fond of watching. I like to listen to it. I like mm -hmm. the idea of the historical, um, the way man has been to the last few th a couple of thousand years and being a part of that. And, and uh, the, the whole thing, even if I was... God and had nothing to I would, to do but watch it. I would probably enjoy watching it. I enjoy Fox News. I enjoy watching the other networks, just the playoff. I, I enjoy the propaganda. I enjoy Putin. I enjoy uh, Assad. <laughs> I no wonder you got to skate all day. <laughs> Clear your brain of all that nonsense. I enjoy the whole fact that the human beings have uh, in, involved to this extent, and, and that I got to, uh, to watch it and be a part of it. I, I think it's just uh, exciting and interesting. Now, <clears throat> as far as um, evolving, using it for involvement, no, it's not at all. It's mm -hmm. not at all meditative, and it's very different. No, as soon as I leave that and start skating, I'm in a whole nother situation. 
So when you start to skate, how long does it take you to access that's that zone like state? Right. It, 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 right now I can do it like in a second or two because mm-hmm. I've I yeah, worked at it. Facility. Yeah. I just right. as soon as I call it right, it's right up here. Um, it's at the top of the hill. I'll take a left turn and start down the hill, and as soon as I do, um, I will drop into a, st- a state of mind which is just infinitely different. Mm-hmm. Than, and it, but it, it took me a couple of years. Like the the first trick uh, is to uh, get in the zone. You have to find a, what I call a gate that is something to help you get in it. Um, whatever it is you're doing, mm-hmm. then the key is as soon as you get in it to stay in it and uh, I just worked at it for the first few years I was skating I had this every day and night to work and so now I can drop right into it it'll be like um, when I was in the Navy I did some research on hypnosis and one time I had um, seven different Marines as in the hospital as patients with this studying mm-hmm. this phenomenon, because there were a lot of people fainting and having syncopal episodes in mm-hmm. the uh, young people. And um, <clears throat> I found out that some people you can hypnotize uh, very quickly, like in a moment. Other people takes a long process, okay? So there's a lot of variation of how quick a person can get into the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, some people naturally can do it very quickly, and others can't. Um, I was sort of in between. It took, it would, I could get in it, but to stay in it more than, say, a, a 30 seconds or a minute. It's a practice, right? It's I mean, a practice, they yeah. say with meditation, you're sitting there and then a thought pops up and you right, go down right. that train for a while and then you go, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to be doing right, that. And you right, bring right, it back. Right, and right, then, right, you know, right, right, when you right, start right. off, you can't sit still for right, five minutes and right. it's just you have to work at it. So right. it's, it's, um, that's the whole trick, and the and what I can tell is that the zone, in, in Amazing Grace, they make a distinction between sight and vision, mm-hmm. um, and and all religious types do, sight and vision. And there's that distinction exists in your own life. Yeah. Right. The yeah. sight, the sight that you lost that gave you the vision to right, live right. the life. Right. Right. When I'm skating. Now. I'm not seeing anything. I'm seeing the vision. I see. It's like I'm not looking at anything. But the 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 whole picture is. It's in the world of the unseen. Which, by the way, you said something about time, uh, space stretching. Mm-hmm. It does stretch. It changes. The thing that makes us think that it doesn't change is that we rely on vision. Once you begin to study space. When you're not looking at it, you learn that it does change size according to movement, just like Einstein and them said, even though it's very small, but we are a lot smaller than we think. In other words, the visual world we live in, which includes us, has given us a false idea of size and also uh, where things are relative to each other. Mm -hmm. And and when you skate in and out and around uh, people, you learn that there's a lot more space than you thought there was, than your mind is seeing, and you learn that there's a, a kind of a super throughness of, of space which is added to by acceleration. For instance, it's a lot harder to, to hit a person if he's in one state of acceleration that is plumb to the earth, so he's standing still, and you're in another state of acceleration, which is rotating, say, uh, in, a, in a pendulum, mm-hmm. uh, which would be carving a turn back and forth. So you can change the space. You have to believe that you, in the vision that you, right, that you're seeing with your mind's eye. And what is and what is it about your specific technique where you have one leg up and your arms in front of you that enhances you? accessing that well, zone-like state. This, that I don't have the final answer to that question. It's been, I, I, I was asked that a bunch of times. All I can say is there's some advantage. The feeling is maximized by being on one foot in that position. Mm-hmm. It seems like, like if... Uh, 
if I try to maximize the feeling of of um, of acceleration or this feeling of the zone of being meditative, which is the feeling I'm trying to get, not acceleration uh, per se, but the feeling, is that I will naturally go into certain positions. Number one is I think that the hands. I've noticed that the hands and the fingers will naturally fall into certain positions in meditation. The positions, you can see it in the ancient religious paintings, that they will often have the two fingers like this, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the Buddha position is is very common, too, in people that are deeply right, meditating. The, the thumb and forefinger right. touching each these other. Are, the, these are uh, automatic positions that have to do with uh, the body language and so on. Of, of being meditative. And uh, all I can say is a lot of birds seem to be meditating standing on one foot. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a, it's a single anchor to the center of the earth, it right? Seems you have to both be, feet down, they're moving around. Which one's the anchor, yeah, right? One, one leg down, yeah. and it's a straight, it's a straight yeah. shot down, right? Yeah, yeah, it could be. <laughs> you know, I think of it that way, even though, you know... It's kind of like a, a moving yoga pose, though. It's like warrior exact, three. It's exactly, like warrior exactly. Three, that's what it, that exactly. That's yeah. exactly what it is. And it adds to the meditative experience. Once you get... Now, because you have to uh, go in and out of people, if you meditate, usually you're alone, right? Think about this. To get meditative and to be right next to your fellow man of all types of all ages and close enough that you could touch him and you're moving by so that nothing is harmful going to happen that what I've experienced being that close to strangers continually in the and I'm in the zone mm -hmm. completely in the zone me and meditative like it'd be like Buddha walks out of his zone and asleep walks right into the crowd of people and mm -hmm. begins to experience them in their normal state to me, it's a type of anthropology that's uh, it's just unreal. Uh, what I've learned about man, the, the mankind by being in this world of strangers, next to them and among them, in a state of meditation. It's sort of like taking the red pill in the matrix and being able to see through the maya, the illusion. Yeah. And so what is your... You know, when you look look out upon mankind, or you're watching the news in the morning, um, you know what is it that you're seeing that we're not seeing? Good. I love your questions. <laughs> um, when I'm in the best state of mind, the best, the ultimate um, meditative state of mind that I've so far gotten is I feel that everything exactly the way it is is the best possible. In other words, I wouldn't want to change anything, like even a death or somebody getting cancer or something like that. I would, in other words, I see the whole thing and I get close enough, I can see it like, wow, it already is the best. The in, like, for instance, uh, the dialectic of trying to figure out whether we should do this or this in politics or something like that. Um, the fact that we don't do this or this, but somehow another kind of waver in between with a lot of argument, I think could conceivably, if we would, could test it, would be the best. In other words, we only know that the world can be one way. It ends up whatever this way or that way, it ends up one way. So in a way, we have a choice whether we believe that that's the ultimate way it could have been or whether it had gone off in some other way that it would have ended up worse. So I, I sort of see that uh, in the best stakes of meditation that I wouldn't want to change anything, um, not even a man's hostility to, to each other. I wouldn't go around saying, love your brother and all that, I, or uh, I wouldn't cure the poor or the alcoholic. I would, I would see the whole thing as an absolute perfect uh, kind of... Um, subjective organism that's evolving and growing like a, a, a plant or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that everything, people are in different stages of this evolvement, if you look at the individuals, but the whole thing is on some sort of um, path where it's feeling its way into the future and it knows what it's doing. 
okay, it, that it, it, it's um, even in small ways uh, that, there, that you can't second-guess God. Mm-hmm. I, I, I sort of feel that. Now, I can, it, when I feel a little less meditative and petty, I can think of all sorts of ways that I would improve the world and do this and that. It, but every, every one of those times, it seems to me I've fallen back into the non-zone mm-hmm. as if I would know, for instance. Right, you're, you're, you're placing your judgment on something that you, yeah. you're not, you don't have all the information. Take, take this uh, situation we've got here with the um, immigration Okay, or the. Uh-oh, we're going to get political here. Uh, well, it's just an example. <laughs> yeah. uh, say, well, what to do with the children, okay, that have come to our border. This is a good example. You could take either one, one direction or the other direction. You can justify either direction. And you could probably say, well, it's going to fall somewhere just kind of in the middle and it'll just kind of end up out there somewhere where you could, uh, the historians can write both sides as if they knew that it happened this way or that way and you'll never really because it's just going to all kind of disappear instead of being well we do this and this we keep our country at the integrity of our country that's the definition of a country or no I'm going to prove what a good person I am you know so like somebody up in San Francisco you know who's going to let everybody in uh, you know to show what a wonderful person person she is San Francisco a bleeding (laughs) heart liberal I mean, you can You're see a conservative the, guy. Yeah, you can see the justification for both positions, yeah. and and I, I personally kind of see that that's this is it. It's not something that I personally know the answer to, mm-hmm. and um, I, it, it, though I was tempted, I grew up in a society. See, I was born in 1943. We were born in the middle of a patriotic time. I was, and there was a country here mm-hmm. called America. We we call it America, the United States, us, we still, U.S. We still call it that, don't we? <laughs> the stop being a country, though. During the uh, what what you've got now is kind of a territory, okay? Because there's a uh, they're not treating it strictly as a country. <laughs> they're not. I mean, the government has taken on another relationship to this area of the continent. Mm-hmm. And so I can see, I grew up thinking we had a country, but I've been able to see, well, if nobody else wants a country, oh, if half of them don't want a country in the old-fashioned sense, where, you know, we're really in it for our country, um, I can go either way. I can see the advantage of going either way. The... Um, I can see that you can justify yourself, believe in either side. Um, there's no, nothing specifically more correct about um, globalism than there is about uh, provincialism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, like you say, I could come down and just care about this right here, or I could care about whether there's life on other planets. I mean... In a way, it's. I've just. I kind of see that it doesn't really. You, this is a thing that's in the hands of of the people, and in history, not in my hands. You know? Right. Well, I mean, essentially, what you're saying is it's not for you to to judge. You're, right. You're sort of right. in this observer I'm a, in this I'm observer a, role. Of yeah. I'm what's in a, going yeah. On. Yeah. If I could, and, I think the. I have to say, I think that. There's two sides. I, I personally am tilted to thinking that if, if you were in politics and you have the responsibility for your fellow man, uh, the fiduciary responsibility, then it's your responsibility to be a patriot. Okay? And that, I think, is a responsibility that is being not taken seriously by a lot of our leaders. Right. True patriotism. <clears throat> well, it depends on your definition of patriotism. Exactly. But, it does. You know, we don't want to go too far down a uh, political uh, black hole here. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It gets blacker and blacker. No, I well, know. you go down it. So, uh, yeah, we should probably wrap it up. We've been going 
for over two hours. Here, that's man. good. Well, you're yeah, a good, good conversationalist. Well, thank just... you. Um, but I wanted to wrap it up kind of with one uh, final thought, which is something you said in the in the, the beautiful documentary, which we didn't even really talk about. But I thought Josh Eisenberg did an amazing did. job with yeah. that movie, and I was so touched by it. And uh, and when, after I watched it, I was like, I've, I got to find this guy. I got to talk to him. So mm-hmm. I'm so happy that we're sitting here and, and doing this. And it was it was uh, I can't imagine the result of that film being at South by Southwest. And I heard you went to the screening, right? That must have been something. And then for yeah. it to be in the New York Times, mm-hmm. how, how has that changed your life or has it? Well, it, it hadn't changed my life at all, but I've, I've gotten just absolute amazing feedback from all mm-hmm. corners. Um, all, it seems to me that almost everybody that saw it really liked it. Now, I wouldn't have necessarily expected that, even though mm-hmm. it was a nice little documentary. But for some reason, almost everybody, and I mean, I, I personally I've heard from hundreds and maybe thousands, and it's coming from all over Europe and mm-hmm. South America and um, uh, not just here, but Ireland. There were some people from Ireland yesterday that mm-hmm. came that, uh, you know, Germany. People knocking on your door all the time now, <laughs> or just out on the boardwalk no, looking no, for you, or no, no. You know, I think of that little place there is going to one day end up like <clears throat> when you're in Amsterdam, you go look at where Van Gogh lived, and mm-hmm. it's like a little place like that. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> like I had a photographer here the other day taking a picture of where uh-huh. I lived, but nobody bothers me. As a matter of <laughs> fact, you know, like I feel that I'm in a protected company. Mm-hmm. My uh, office. well, you're you're a, you're an institution down here. I mean, yeah. There's nobody in this community that doesn't know who you are, and I would imagine that they, you know, I don't know. Like it's probably cool for them that you got yeah. this exposure, yeah. but they probably also feel protective of you. I would. Oh imagine yeah, yeah, bit. yeah. Like, hey, he's yeah. ours. Like, don't get too close, or that's don't, what don't happens mess like, with them. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You know, I, I remember um, thinking that. Let's see, the guy that up in San Francisco, that um, Tony Bennett. Hmm. Uh, he's walk. He he tries to live a normal life. Is what I mm-hmm. I saw on TV one time and goes to the grocery store and that type of thing. I thought at the time when I saw it, I was thinking like that's what a person ought to do, is really just stay simple and like they are, and still be who they are. Now, that's all I do. I don't change. I, I, I'm in this uh, state of mind, mm-hmm. but frankly, um, it doesn't. It hadn't changed my... I think I'm old enough where it has not affected my ego. I had a guy... Um, I used to have an ego. Mm-hmm. Now I got that part. But uh, but I, uh, but I now, um, you know, it, one of the interviews, this lady was saying, Slow Mo has life figured out. Slow Mo has life figured out. She said it about three or four times. And I'm standing there going like, gosh, that's a disappointment. Because if, if I've got it figured out, it can't be all that. <laughs> right. I mean, that... that- Grabs headline, you know that's a catchy yeah. headline that will get people to listen or go to that website or what have you. But you know, it's but I'm very modest about the slow mo. I feel that I'm on a mission from God, as as they would have said mm-hmm. in the Blues Brothers. I've not done anything to commercialize it, uh, which if I was early in my life, I'd you're wearing just so people listening. If you watch the documentary, you're wearing <clears> the <throat> same shirt, the same hat, and the same cargo shorts that you were wearing in the documentary right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just um, no. My my whole existence now is um, is the world of subjectivity, and what um, what we really are on the on the side of subjectivity. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you said in the documentary, and this is probably a great place to close it, um, that you felt you feel that you're on the tip of a great iceberg of consciousness. So maybe you can just expand on that a little bit. Um, the image, the, the meta. Thanks again yeah. for a great question. The, the, to me, the metaphor of um, an iceberg is the perfect metaphor for a lot of things. Um, the main thing is the human being himself. Um, the tip of the iceberg is usually we think of it as being the part that's. The, t- the tips of various nearby icebergs are, say they're talking to each other, and mm-hmm. one of them knows that this one is so-and-so, the specifics. But the major part of the iceberg is generic. It's under the sea. 
um, and it doesn't fit the the tip of the iceberg. But when I'm skating, I feel like I'm at the tip of what is the human mind. It's the top, the very peak. And um, but what I see when I relate to other people now, it's all below. It's all generic. For instance, with all due respect to your individual person, I see you as one more of these. Mm-hmm. And you've been here before, 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 and you've had other capacities, other lives, the generic. And this is the tip of the iceberg at this moment, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, you're carrying the consciousness, which is uh, you're obviously very much aware of, your self-awareness. And it's part of the iceberg, but it's always been there, and it came from under the sea. And it'll pop back up like another tip, another tip, and so on. I like that. Thanks for talking to me, Slomo. Peace. Plants. Yeah.